Natasha Gupps with the MBA Investment Fund, and we're going to be presenting Yum Brands to you today. So Yum Brands is the world's largest restaurant company and has three primary concepts, KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut. And we're recommending an overweight in the growth fund of 150 basis points. Currently, we have a 65 basis point overweight in the fund, and we'll be adding opportunistically to build up to the 150 basis point total overweight. Our price target is $84, which represents a potential upside of 26%. Another important thing to highlight on this particular chart is that the return on invested capital is 30%, which we think is really high, and we'll be talking about more going forward. So Yum! has three distinct concepts, KFC, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell. Taco Bell is something that we think of more in the U.S. as being the dominant of the three, but actually in China and the rest of the world, KFC and Pizza Hut actually have the most units total worldwide. Additionally, it's important to note on this chart that in the U.S., each of these three concepts holds fairly dominant market share within their respective fair concept. Next, we wanted to look at the ownership types that Yum! has. Yum! has two different ownership types, Yum! Owned and then Franchise. On the owned, on the owned side, um, the revenue as well as the operating profit is substantially higher, and this is because Yum! actually owns the plant, the equipment, the land, and takes all of the operating um, expenses on their own. But they have a lower margin relative to the franchisee model. Um, however, the return on average assets is still relatively high at 23%. On the franchisee side, each of the franchisees are responsible for putting together all of the land, equipment, and all the expenses. However, Young does provide initial as well as ongoing training to help facilitate consistency across each of the concept stores. And they receive an upfront fee as well as an ongoing royalty of 4 to 6%. The result of this, as compared to the owned model, is that the franchisee model has lower revenue and lower operating profit but the margins as well as the return on average assets are substantially higher at nearly 100% on return on average assets. So the next thing we wanted to look at was how has Yum looked over the course of time. And what we can see is that the franchisee model portion has been relatively stable at 75%. Um, however, in 2008, they've been slightly increasing this, and this is due to refranchising re efforts, which basically means that they're taking Yum-owned stores and turning them into franchisee stores. So not only does Yum! operate across three different concepts and two different ownership models, but they also have a global reach. What we can see that's important in this particular chart is that the U.S. has is 80, is 48 percent of all the units, but they only contribute 27 percent of the operating profits. And this is due to the fact that most of these stores are franchised. In contrast to this, China represents only 12 percent of the units but they are 42% of the operating profits, and this is due to the fact that most of these stores are Yum! owned. And now John Dowling will go into why, uh, why we like Yum! Thanks, Natasha. So our investment thesis on Yum! is pretty straightforward. Restaurants have two ways to grow. One is that they can increase the number of units that they have. The second is to increase same-store sales. And we think that Yum! has an incredible ability to grow their unit count going forward. In particular, we think that these opportunities are very strong within China, which is its largest and highest return on capital segment. So if there's an area that you can pick to grow, you would pick this area, and we think that Yum! has an incredible opportunity to do so going forward. We think that this Chinese growth story is gonna be supported by further unit growth within the rest of the world segment, which is essentially everything other than China and the US, as well as a continued turnaround in the Taco Bell franchise within the US. And this is important because these three businesses, that's China, that's the rest of the world, and U.S. Taco Bell, accounted for about 90% of 2011 operating profits. So you're essentially seeing growth in every area that matters to young. Finally, we think that the growth is going to be supported by the continuation of the refranchising effort that Natasha mentioned. And this is really important to free up capital to allow young to invest in these high growth opportunities while still maintaining their high dividend yield and their significant share repurchases. So let's talk a little bit more about China. Yum! has an absolutely dominant position within China, and that's evident across a number of fronts. Many things that you can look at, we've just picked a couple here. First, Yum! is about a third of the market cap of McDonald's, but has three times as many locations within China as McDonald's does. It's also growing at three times the rate, so that gap in terms of the number of units is just growing and growing. In addition, they've been much more aggressive in moving into lower tier cities. So as opposed to having most of the locations in Shanghai and Beijing and those you know, tier one, tier two cities, they've moved into smaller tier cities. And this does a couple of things for the company. One, there tends to be a lot less competition there, which improves returns. 
Two, there tends to be much less labor cost inflation, which has been an issue, and I'll talk about that more uh, here in a bit. And then third, uh, these industries or these cities tend to be much less tied to export industries. So they've uh, been much more resilient as the Chinese economy has been slowing uh, within the last several quarters. And so we think that this, as well as their innovative business model, has really driven strong performance, a strong outperformance relative to McDonald's, particularly uh, lately. If you look at comparable same-store sales, they've been consistently higher than McDonald's since the end of 2010, early 2011, and you can see that there have been six consecutive quarters of double-digit same-store sales growth, so clearly a very strong business model. But probably the most telling thing, the thing that we like the most, is the strong returns on capital that they have within China. Um, we're using return on assets here as a proxy for return on capitals, and what you can see from the chart in the bottom right-hand side of your screen is that Yelm is earning returns on assets above 35%, which is, first of all, incredible, and second of all, you know, significantly higher than what McDonald's is currently earning in China, as well as what Yelm is earning outside of the Chinese market in their other business segments. So you essentially have this, that's the, you know, the highest return on capital segment, and also, as Natasha pointed out, it's the largest segment. So again, if you have an opportunity to grow, you want to grow here, and we think that Yelm has great opportunities to do so. The biggest driver for that that we see is unit growth expansion. Uh, China is, or Yelm is not near saturation point within China, and this is evident in a number of things as well. Uh, they currently have about 4,500 locations. Management thinks that they can get to 20,000 just based on current demand alone. So this isn't assuming you know, any further growth going forward. This is just based on today's demand. And we looked at this a number of ways. We looked at it on the basis of GDP, on the basis of how many people live you know, in urban locations. And no matter how you slice it and dice it, it's clear that, again, they're nowhere near saturation and have an incredible opportunity to continue adding units, even without you know, really strong growth uh, within the Chinese economy. So how do we see this playing out? We think that they can conservatively add 500 plus locations each year for the next eight years, essentially taking them from those 4,500 locations to almost doubling to 9,000, uh, or near 9,000 by 2018. And importantly, this fact alone, this unit growth alone, will drive 11% growth in this segment, which again, is the most important, most critical segment for young. So we think that these are really strong opportunities and will be highly accretive and, and highly value adding to shareholders going forward. So that's the unit growth side. Let's talk about same store sales and what's happening uh, within comps. And I think that this is the area where our view most differs from the general marketplace. Uh, it's no secret that the Chinese economy has been slowing. There have been nine consecutive quarters of GDP growth deceleration within China. And uh, that's caused a lot of fears among the market of what happens to the Chinese economy, in particular, what happens to young within China. There's one data point in particular. Uh, this summer, the purchasing manager index came out sharply lower. And that created a lot of fear about Young's you know, success going forward within China. Uh, it sent the stock down 15% and caused street analysts to really you know, play this up in the research notes. And we think that that kind of fear has penetrated the market and, and has, has spread, causing people to think that the Chinese growth story is dead within Young. We think that this is overdone, and in fact that this presents a compelling buying opportunity for a couple of reasons. First, as I talked about, we really view um, young as a unit growth story and think that this unit growth opportunity you know, still exists even in a slowing environment as I talked about you know, at length on the last slide. But more importantly, we think that the market underestimates Yum's ability to grow volumes even in a slower GDP growth world within China. And we think that the reason that the market doesn't understand this is that simply the company doesn't report it. So it's not easy to follow. What we've actually done here, if you look at the, uh, the bottom part of this slide, is we've essentially come up with a proxy for volume growth by taking comps and subtracting out uh, CPI as it relates to food within China. And what you can see here is, in our view, a very noticeable trend. Starting at the end of 2010, moving into early 2011, they've consistently grown volumes even as GDP growth has decelerated, as I mentioned. So how have they done that? Well, one of them is the uh, you know, greater concentration in the lower tier cities, as I mentioned, but they've also been very innovative in their business model. Uh, they've done what they call expanding day parts, so they've moved into breakfast. That's been rolled out in all the locations and accounts for about six or seven percent of sales, which is actually increasing. Um, they've also moved to 24-hour service and delivery service in a lot of their Chinese locations. They're in about 50 percent so far, still in the process of rolling that out. And all of these things serve to increase volumes within an existing store, and we think that this has plenty of legs to run. Again, I mentioned about 50 percent um, of stores have 24-hour 
uh, are open 24 hours and have delivery service. And so as this continues to roll out and become more popular within their locations, we see at least you know, two to three years of continued volume growth, uh, which is not, you know, not, does not need the GDP growth um, that you know, may or may not exist. So we think that it's actually a very resilient play, and we think that it's going to be very successful in China, whether the Chinese economy rebounds strongly or not. So that's China. Let's talk about the rest of the world for a little bit. Again, we see strong unit growth opportunities, not quite as strong as China, but you know, certainly strong and steady and will provide some support to the growth story. You look at the business, it's very well diversified geographically, but it's much more focused on emerging markets than a lot of their competitors. This, as well as their low saturation, in our view, creates a big opportunity for unit growth. Again, if you look at it on the basis of you know, potential markets, it's, it's really clear that there's a lot of opportunity to add them, again, without getting anywhere close to saturation. Given that this is a largely franchise business, as Natasha mentioned, uh, one of the things that we look at as a potential governor of growth is their ability to find high quality franchisees, people who are willing to invest the capital in the brand and take on the risk associated with opening a new location. We actually think that this is a really strong suit for Yum on a, for a couple of reasons. One is that they have a really strong brand uh, within most of these markets and that allows them to have some familiarity with the owners. It gives the, the franchisee some trust that they're going to be dealing with a fair and reputable partner. And it also uh, kind of creates some built-in demand for the product. Consumers are already aware of KFC, um, of Pizza Hut, and to a lesser extent Taco Bell in these markets. And so that creates some built-in demand where you see you know, really long lines at the grand opening days. So this combined with, more importantly, you know, the really strong uh, economics to the franchisees of about a three-year cash payback, we think will continue to attract high-quality franchisees that are willing to invest in this brand. And that this will drive uh, or will be the largest component in 9% profit growth annually through 2018. Um, again, largest component being unit growth here. Finally, let's talk about the U.S. Taco Bell franchise. This accounts for about 60% of their U.S. operating profits. And frankly, 2011 was a really bad year for Taco Bell. Um, you may recall there was a lawsuit that was filed in the first part of the year claiming that Taco Bell doesn't use real beef. While Taco Bell was totally vindicated, there was no settlement, anything like that, as the suit was dropped. Uh, it certainly had a reputational impact and had a brand impact on Taco Bell. And that sent sales down for the better part of the year. The company has responded aggressively to this, largely through product innovation. They rolled out the Doritos Locos Taco. They've also moved into breakfast, which they're calling first meal. It's in about 20% of the locations. Uh, it's accounted for 6 or 7% of sales there as well, so it's been highly successful. But again, still in the early innings of, of rolling that out to their locations uh, on an opportunistic basis. And the most recent thing that they've done, and one that's probably caught the most attention recently, is Cantina Bell. And here they're really taking on Chipotle, trying to offer a similar kind of fast, casual quality food at about 70% of the cost. And we think that this is likely to be somewhat successful in, one, driving incremental traffic, and two, uh, encouraging some Taco Bell customers to trade up to a higher price point, higher margin item. So the evidence or the, um, the success of these initiatives is already evident. Um, U.S. operating profits are within the Taco Bell are up 26% year over year through the first half. We think that's going to moderate to about 20% over the full year, and then 5 to 6% thereafter. And again, this is important because Taco Bell accounts for the majority of uh, Yum's U.S. operating profit. So that's kind of the growth story. And again, it's important to keep in mind that these three things that we've talked about, that's China, that's the rest of the world, that's U.S. Taco Bell, account for 90% of operating profits. So you're seeing strong growth here. This last point is really something that we see as supplementing that story and helping to finance it. As Natasha mentioned, uh, Yum is currently in the process of going through a refranchising effort where they're essentially taking units that they own and selling them off to entrepreneurs. Um, they started this a little while back and it's already been very successful and we think that it has a lot of room to run. They've gone from about 25% of the U.S. locations being company owned uh, back in the 2005-2006 timeframe down to 13% today, and we think that, that has further room to fall to about 8% by 2018. We also see a similar trend going on within the rest of the world segment, so you can kind of take these effects and, and multiply them, so to speak. So let's talk about refranchising and essentially what happens. The most obvious thing is that as you sell off the location, you're going to receive cash, you're going to free up the capital that you have associated with that, and there's an opportunity then to invest that in a higher margin, higher return opportunity. The other component is what happens to operating profits. As Natasha mentioned, on average, 
uh, the company-owned locations generate greater profits than the franchised locations. And the reason for that is really simple. If you own the location, then you have exposure to 100% of the unit economics, whereas if you're franchising it, really what you're getting is a 4 to 6% slice off revenues. And so it's, you've got uh, exposure to a smaller portion of that pie. But what the company's actually finding is as they're able to, uh, as they're refranchising, what they're typically doing is selling off the underperforming locations. And in a lot of instances, they're able to find a franchisee that you know, for sure has lower operating costs, probably has greater operational expertise, uh, probably has greater local expertise, and certainly has stronger incentives to increase profitability. And so in many times, they're, what they're able to do is increase profitability to the level that that 4 to 6% royalty stream is very similar to what they were getting on the full 100% piece of the pie or the full unit economics um, of a particular unit. And that's really evident if you look at Pat, if you look back over the last five years. And so essentially what we have on this slide is, is what's happened over that time frame. What they've done is they've sold off 3,300 locations. Uh, they freed up $1.2 billion of capital. And the annualized impact of profitability is only $8 million a year. So it's freeing up a lot of capital with very little um, profit charge or profit impact, essentially. And we think that this has a lot of rooms to run. So over the next you know, five or six years, we see them refranchising more than 2,000 additional units, which will free up about $750 million of essentially really low cost of capital money that they can employ in those growth markets. And so that essentially allows you to build you know, six, 700 locations in China and continue paying out the 2% dividend yield that they have, as well as the $800 million per year or so uh, in share repurchases. And so we think that this will you know, help finance the story and be um, you know, very successful for shareholders. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael to walk you through our valuation. Thanks, John. So looking at our DCF valuation, uh, we calculated a price target of about $84, which at current prices uh, would be a potential return of about 26%. Uh, this represents about 21 times the 2013 EPS uh, and 16 times 2015 EPS. So looking at some of our key drivers uh, in the upper right hand corner of the slide, uh, China owned units we projected out growing at about 11% um, CAGR, which is in line with historical uh, numbers. Rest of world units growing at about five, a steady 5% and US owned margins increasing from 12% to 15% due to the turnaround in the Taco Bell. Uh, unit and all of this gives us a NOPAT uh, growth of about 13%. We also incorporated a terminal growth rate of four and a half percent and a model WAC of nine and a half percent. This model WAC number includes a cost of equity of about 10%, which we felt was a reasonable um, return for equity owners uh, based on the, the 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 low risk of this investment. So there's certainly risks that we need to take into consideration. Uh, first and foremost. Uh, John talked about the economic factors in China with the, the concerns over the slowing growth, but there's also concerns over input costs. Uh, labor uh, has increased in China pretty rapidly. And then just managing growth uh, as you add units to China. These are company-owned stores, and so the, uh, the company has to be able to manage that, and they start working off of a bigger base. And so that can be very difficult. It can slow the growth rate. Um, so it's something we need to be aware of. And then foreign exchange. So uh, Yum generates about 70% of their income from overseas uh, internationally, and so any strengthening of the U.S. dollar could negatively impact earnings. Um, and then nutritional preferences, so as consumers start to eat healthier, they're buying organics and things like that, um, this could also have a negative impact on, on Yum's business as well. And so incorporating these risks into our DCF model, we came up with a price uh, of about $55 for the downside, um, which at current prices is a uh, a loss of about 18%. Um, so looking at our key drivers, we, we took them down quite a bit. So if you look at China-owned unit growth, we cut that almost in half from 11% down to about 6%. Uh, rest of the world unit growth from 5% down to 4%. And 2018 US margins we kept flat um, from 12% uh, to 12%. Um, no, and the NOPAC growth goes down to about 8%. Uh, so we also lowered the terminal growth rate down to 4%. You can see in the chart in the top right corner the, uh, the difference between our bear case and our bull case. Um, so significant uh, uh, discretion, significant divergence between the, uh, the two models. So in conclusion, Yum is a, a, a unique growth story. They have a dominant position in China, which is the world's premier growth market. They also have a very long runway to continue adding units. 
um, and growing. They'll, this will be supported by international growth in the rest of the world and a turnaround in their Taco Bell business. Um, and we feel that their continued refranchising effort will free up capital for reinvestment with having minimal impact on earnings. And that's it. Thank you.